Thank you very much, Rupert. Thank you, Sarah. I really uh, very happy to participate in this. It's a great meeting. I know you've uh, you've done a lot for this. My only uh, regret is that we couldn't be there in person. Um, so I, I'm hoping uh, today uh, I'd like to cover kind of bring you up to date on where things have gone with our understanding of the neurobiology of ketamine treatments. Um, but I want to do it in a way of presenting a timeline of kind of giving the history and bringing us up to date. Um, it's impossible for me to cover every possible part of the neurobiology. I know we have breakout sessions where hopefully we get a chance to talk about that. I'm gonna to try to do it in a more cohesive narrative way, but uh, uh, hopefully I'll touch on most things and those that we don't, we can talk about later. Um, would like to just uh, move forward and, um, whoops, why is it not advancing for me? Um, there we go. Um, I, I do have several disclosures, so please uh, um, note that. And if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd be more than glad to talk about that. And Rupert, thank you for mentioning that I will be talking about ketamine here. And uh, again, uh, IV racemic ketamine is not, uh, does not have a license or, or an indication by the FDA uh, as a treatment. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. So I, specifically what I'd like to do is to cover a few things. One, just really give a brief understanding is, you know, why do we really care about the neurobiology of, you know, it works, why do we care? Um, but I, I'd like to, you know, give a few reasons why we should care. And then to talk a little bit about the event setting the stage of the discovery of ketamine's antidepressant effects. And then really to do as much as I can to bring us up to date on what our current understanding is of the more basic neurobiological principles of its effects. And, and I'll touch a little bit on some of the other um, non-direct uh, or proximal effects of the pharmacology. And then ultimately to outline sort of the key relevant questions that remain, including where's the next generation. So, as I said, the first question is, you know, why do we really need to understand the underlying mechanisms? And I'd like to say, hey, for those of us are attending this, or for those that are really clinicians and, and not scientists or not drug development people, you know, why should we really worry so much about the mechanism? And, and I think it's important for several reasons, but the most being, we really need to understand and predict both the moderate and mediated so we understand the risk and benefits of the treatment and things like which medications can we or should we avoid giving with the treatment or what should we try to combine with the treatment, ways of developing and optimizing ketamine response. Are there things that we can use adjunctively or concomitantly to, to amplify those effects? If we understand the mechanism, we may be able to optimize the efficiency so do we really need to have these long infusions? Could we give very short periods? Could we dose more frequently? Can we dose more uh, with, a, with a longer interval? I mean, these are all very important questions that we can learn from the mechanism. And then lastly, but and I think very uh, importantly is ways of understanding how to develop the next generation of antidepressants. So uh, if we just start, Briefly, um, the need is pretty obvious. The need for new antidepressants, despite the real benefits that our existing uh, antidepressant treatments have brought over the past 50 years, uh, it's still, depression still remains one of the leading causes of disability throughout the world. The rates of suicide, at least in the US, have actually been increasing over the past decades. Um, and we know from the STAR-D, but many of these other more real world type studies that there are real limitations to the effectiveness of our treatments, especially after you get beyond the standard one or two trials of antidepressants. But the fact that most of these all targeted the same mechanisms, it shouldn't be that surprising that if you don't respond to one or two of that class, the chances of the third or fourth working are you know, greatly reduced. So all these are pretty obvious arguments. And, and the additional argument is the time it 
has required for these antidepressants to have real benefit. And this again, from the STAR-D study, you could see even to the patients that ultimately do go on to have a good response, it's typically taking about six weeks for people to get to at least having half that improvement. So there's a real, uh, there has always been a real unmet need for having increased uh, speed of onset. And in fact, um, if you go back just, just 20 years ago, this is Elliot Rickerson um, wrote, you know, sort of that it's always been the holy grail in the field to have these rapid onset of antidepressant-like effects, but they just didn't exist. And 20 years ago, it was written as just the given that it's going to take a long time for antidepressants to work. And I think ketamine possibly more than anything has just changed that perspective and it changed that perspective in the field that you could have rapid onset of effects, um, which has really ha had a, a big influence on the, on the field and the future of the field. Um, I think the, you know, the, the next, uh, oops, sorry. The next is, you know, why ketamine? What, why, why did anybody really start using ketamine um, as an antidepressant? Um, well, it really, it dates back quite a while. Now it dates back, you know, going um, 60 years ago, George Crane, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before, but uh, noticed that when d uh, was being used um, as a treatment for tuberculosis, um, that their patients were having this very rapid onset of improvement, specifically in their mood, their sleep, their, uh, their anorexia, their eating uh, problems. You know, these, these were people with tuberculosis being treated. And a you know, quote right out of his paper is, it's difficult to explain why psychiatric benefits should have occurred almost immediately following drug administration. I mean, at the time, there was no idea that the ceramicin that was being used had any, um, uh, the, the, the serine had any, uh, effects on the glutamatergic system. In fact, at the time, glutamate wasn't even recognized as a neurotransmitter. But you know, in retrospect, this may have been one of the original findings showing that a drug targeting the NMDA receptor of uh, the glutamatergic neurotransmitter system could have these rapid onset of antidepressant effects. Um, but really, it was the discovery of ketamine, which came you know, from uh, PCP, uh, the work uh, that was done at Park Davis Labs and others developing uh, fencyclidine. And then a lot of credit goes to Ed Domino, who really took this um, and started to develop ketamine as an anesthetic, uh, which it received its FDA approval in 1970, um, but really pushed us to understand the, the basic pharmacology uh, and neurobiology much better. And that's when we started to realize that ketamine prominent effects, or, or it's probably its largest effects, uh, definitely in, in, in producing some, some of its anesthetic properties uh, is by acting as a non-selective, um, non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonist. So uh, and with that, it entered into the world of psychiatry research. A lot of the original research was actually using ketamine as a model for psychosis, uh, which in in some indirect way was actually how we ended up using it for depression. I'll talk about that a little bit. But there were also um, studies that came out very early uh, that uh, I, I talk about it kind of dying on the branch. There were findings out there uh, from uh, very different perspectives. A study that came out of Tehran as early as 1973 where ketamine was used uh, really as an assisted psychotherapy approach and uh, really looking at effects on app reaction, um, which I actually had to look up to see what that meant. I'm, I'm not a, uh, a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, but it was really this release, this catharsis, catharsis the ability to have that. And they, they interestingly, you know, after treating a hundred patients and at, in this paper, they weren't using DSM diagnoses at all. These were just 100 psychiatric patients in hospitals. Um, they arrived at a dose of 0.5 mg per kg as being kind of the ideal dose, which was a, you know, interesting, not a very scientific approach to dose finding, but still an interesting finding, but really reported these rapid onset of benefits in, that, in those patients. Uh, and then there was also, uh, I identified through animal studies in these uh, version of high throughput screens they had at the time 
of having antidepressant-like effects. And that goes back to 1974. So going pretty far back, there was some clue that ketamine may have antidepressant effects. But I have to say those studies and that data kind of died on the branch. It really, if you look at the history of it, it wasn't that these studies were what eventually evolved into our current use for the most part, and definitely hasn't, wasn't the lineage that ended up with the FDA indication for uh, esketamine. Uh, what really was more in the direct line to that was some evidence that were occurring um, or, or being uh, discovered around the turn of the millennia. So this is the time when Wayne Drevitz had some seminal work um, and Doug Bremner, Vetchelin, showing that there were actually volumetric and structural changes associated with depression, areas like the subgeneral prefrontal cortex, regions of the hippocampus, um, that were actually showing pretty dramatic changes. And other work coming out of Grajnarskowska's lab and others uh, showing that there were cellular and cytoarchitectural changes, it, in large part, uh, changes in glial cell number and density um, that were occurring in patients with depression. And right around the same time, there was also a, a flurry of uh, evidence coming out suggesting that the glutamatergic neurotransmitter system uh, was likely to be a key player in this patho pathoetiology or pathophysiology, uh, linking this stress, linking stress to major depressive disorder. So we're from Bob Sapolsky's lab, Bruce McEwen's lab, really showing how stress could have these toxic effects and how that could be mediated through glutamatergic uh, action. Work by Vita Mogadam's lab, and I'll show some, uh, some other work from her lab, but using microdialysis, showing that stress can induce this rapid bolus release of glutamate and, and, and other work, better understanding how this could have toxic effects all was coming out right around the turn of the millennia. We were starting to understand that the glutamatergic system may play a prominent role in uh, this translation from stress to depression. Uh, with that, we also started to get a much better understanding of the pharmacology of glutamate and it's an incredibly rich and complex pharmacology. And this is just a slide uh, basically showing all the different areas that can be targeted pharmacologically um, with glutamate um, within the glutamatergic system. And NMDA uh, receptors sit right in a key position to, um, to modulate NMDA, uh, to modulate glutamate function. And having ketamine available was a great opportunity. Along with that, there were studies um, by Phil Skolnick's lab out uh, at the NIH at the time, um, really starting to uncover the role of the NMDA receptor um, in the pathophysiology, especially the stress-related uh, effects, but some of the initial work showing that antagonists of the NMDA receptor could actually have antidepressant-like effects in rodent models. So this was the data that was you know, available in the late 1990s when um, John Crystal, uh, Dennis Charney, Rob Berman, and, and, and a few others at, at Yale um, really uh, devised the first study uh, specifically looking at treatment of depression with ketamine. And this is actually a quote uh, from a paper that we wrote that actually taken right from, from John and, and, and Dennis giving some of this feedback, but it, as to what was their thinking behind doing that first study. And as captured here, John really would say that it was this change in perspective, this idea that <clears throat> initially the monoaminergic system uh, sat at its hypothesis that you know if, if there are really problems within the mono, monoaminergic system, these are really uh, problems more centrally located within the pons and midbrain, and that the cortex is really sort of secondary to this. With all this other evidence coming out suggesting that there was m more evidence of cortical or um, uh, subgeneral regions or hippocampal regions being involved, which are predominantly uh, regulated by glutamatergic and GABAergic systems, that it would be wise to investigate whether targeting those systems could have antidepressant-like effects. And that was really what led them to that first study um, that was performed where they did a simple 
seven patients or actually eight patients data really from, from seven in the long run, where it was randomized crossover study. I'm sure everybody's very familiar with this. One dose of ketamine, one dose of saline. And that was really where this rapid onset of antidepressant effect was discovered and where uh, it, things took off from. And then the history of that would be that, uh, and it's actually, here's another the quote from John. I, I really, just to capture their surprise in this effect, this wasn't, I, when this study was done, it really wasn't done with the idea that they were gonna give ketamine a single dose and you're gonna get this rapid improvement. Um, it really, they were aware of the data from Phil Skolnick's lab. They were aware of the pathophysiology, but weren't really expecting this rapid response. So as John actually said, to the amazement of our patients and ourselves, um, we found ketamine produced rapid and profound and surprisingly durable antidepressant effects. Um, so it, it, I, this was a case where serendipity favored the prepared mind, I think. Um, that um, the history of that would move to that Dennis Charney then moved to the NIH and, and replicated this study. And this, I always say, is a lesson to all of us in the field. All of us were well aware of this finding uh, that was published in 2000 in Berman, but being academicians, we all spent so much time trying to figure out what was the mechanism. It really took six years just to replicate it, um, is what you know, what Dennis and Carlos uh, Zarate did at the NIMH, uh, just replicated that study, almost identical replication of that original study with a, with a slightly larger group of 18 people. And from there, I think most of you are well aware of the history in terms of um, the highly consistent findings of rapid onset of antidepressant effects lasting for periods of days to weeks, and in some cases, months after treatment. Now I wanna move a little bit to you know, more of the basic understanding and where things have evolved. And this is a classic case of reverse translational medicine or what we typically say, instead of bench to bedside, this is actually bedside to bench. So based on those findings, things move backwards and in psychiatry, we're, we're really good at that. We haven't quite mastered going from bench to bedside yet, but we're, we're pretty good about going backwards. Um, so this is just a, a, a cartoon version, very diagrammatic version of what uh, the glutamatergic tripartite synapse looks like, where glutamate is released from the presynaptic neuron, has its effects largely postsynaptically, and is cleared through the glial cell. Um, the idea originally was that potentially due to damage on glial cells or for other reasons of high stress, there was high levels of glutamate, especially high levels of glutamate, reaching these extrasynaptic NMDA receptors causing toxicity. And the idea was that if you could block those NMDA receptors, you may be able to remove that toxicity and prevent some of the damage associated with um, stress and, and the pathophysiology of depression. However, we start to realize that this really doesn't explain things very well. This would probably take much longer than hours to have an effect. And it really is just uh, looking at a small uh, portion of what we know ketamine does. So other work uh, had been done and we know that uh, the GABAergic interneurons uh, in the cortex exert uh, tonic inhibitory effects uh, on uh, the release of glutamate, especially in pyramidal cells and, and some other glutamatergic cells in, in the cortex and in hippocampus. Um, and when you block those receptors, and there's some evidence to suggest that this is one of the primary mechanisms, that ketamine at these lower doses more selectively blocks the um, excitation of these inhibitory neurons, you release that inhibition and by releasing that inhibition, you increase glutamate release and then activation of the postsynaptic receptors, including AMPA, that may be minimized um, in, in the pathophysiologic model. And there's really nice evidence to suggest that this is a critical effect uh, in generating the mechanism of antidepressant response. And a lot of this work comes from using AMPA uh, inhibitors or AMPA blockers. Uh, the, where if you give concomitantly ketamine with an AMPA blocker or any of these other NMDA receptor targeting drugs, and this is just showing MK801 or the Roche compound, that you get this antidepressant-like response in the rodent model. But 
if you block the AMPA receptor, you lose that effect. So this is some of the best and earliest evidence that was developed to suggest that the release of glutamate and this postsynaptic activation of non-NMDA glutamate receptors was critical to the mechanism. And some more evidence to suggest that this release of glutamate is in fact critical comes from dose response uh, studies. I, I mentioned before Beta Mogadam's lab doing microdialysis, but she also uh, with stress, but she also did work with ketamine showing that sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine, and these are in rodents, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams of sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine can rapidly release glutamate um, into the extrasynaptic space, inter extracellular space that can be picked up by microdialysis. And it lasts for about an hour or so, and then it goes back down towards normal. Um, but interestingly, if you go up, and it's only a twofold increase going from 30 megs per keg to less than twofold, 50 megs per keg, you no longer see that increase in glutamate release. In fact, you see in both cases, just the stress of giving an um, intraperitoneal injection causes this bolus uh, of glutamate release briefly. But when you start to go up in higher doses of ketamine, you actually block that. Um, so it's this interesting finding that this rapid release, bolus release of glutamate, occurs in an inverted U-shaped curve. And then there's other work using some in vivo microdialysis studies um, showing that this is fairly regionally selective in terms of its activation, uh, largely in the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, some in the thalamus, but not diffuse threat, well, not in every region of the brain. And you can see this by, by uh, showing that, that with 35 mg per kg, um, which is that sub dose increases the metabolic activity in these brain regions. But if you go up to that 100 mg per keg, you actually decrease it. So again, really good evidence that there's a U-shaped curve. And one of the reasons why I always warn people that you know, if the dose of ketamine isn't working, it's not always, let's go higher. That, that may not be the case. Um, and we did some more work looking at this and we could using C13 micro uh, using C13 magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is a way of looking at the glutamate, glutamine cycling, uh, uh, an indirect way of measuring glutamate release. We can see a very nice dose response curve in the rodents all the way up to 30 mg per keg, which is all uh, relatively low sub anesthetic doses. But when we go up to that higher dose of 80, we lose that effect on cycling. So it's just more evidence to suggest that there really is a, a, a more narrow, if you want to call it a therapeutic window, at least in terms of the glutamate release. And we were able to show that in the rodent model, at least there's that inverted U shaped curve with the antidepressant like effect 24 hours uh, later. So again, the higher doses we actually in rodents and that's been replicated many times, higher doses of ketamine actually don't have the same antidepressant like effect as the lower doses. Um, and uh, timing wise, we were able to do some work to show that it's a pretty short lived effect. So after giving the dose of ketamine, in this case, it's, it's interperitoneal, but it's fairly similar kinetics to, to a, an IV. Um, you know, we see this increases in cycling that lasts, it happens very quickly within the first you know, 15, 20 minutes. And by 30 minutes, it's actually decreasing by an hour. We're not seeing anything. And in fact, 24 hours later, when we're seeing these behavioral changes, we're definitely not seeing any increase in glutamate cycling. If anything, you know, there's maybe a trend for a decrease, but really nothing major. And that, um, that is very much in line with what we see with the microdialysis studies. Um, so it really is just to get to the point that it seems like this glutamate release, at least in the rodent models, plays a critical role in generating these antidepressant-like effects even though it's 24 hours later when we're not seeing a big increase in glutamate release any longer. So it suggests that it's initiating some cascade of event downstream. Uh, I just put this slide in here to show that this is some work uh, Chetty Abdullah did while he was at Yale, showing that we can actually show these changes in glutamate labeling um, uh, with uh, glutamine labeling suggesting the cycling is increasing in humans too. So it's not just in rodents that we see this. And there's even some clinical data suggesting that there may be some evidence of an inverted U-shaped curve. Um, this is the RAPID study um, done, uh, the, the consortium study looking at various doses of ketamine, a single dose IV, either 
0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or one megs per k compared to uh, midazolam as the control. And you can see uh, the actual, the, the dose that had the highest benefit, although th this wasn't powered to really tell specific differences between the doses, but we could see that that 0.5 megs per keg dose really did well. And going up to one meg per keg really didn't add any benefit to that response. So then I, I talked a little bit about the downstream effects. So I just want to um, just want to continue with that. So what is the evidence, you know, you get this rapid bolus release, but what is the downstream effects? And what, this is all work that was going on, you know, now about 10 years ago, eight years ago. And a large part of this was done in Ron Duman's lab, who really deserves credit for a, a lot of advancing our understanding of the molecular mechanisms uh, of ketamine. So yeah, the paper that came out in Science, um, which again, um, showed that inverted uh, U-shaped curve uh, with antidepressant-like response where a uh, nice antidepressant response 24 hours later after 10 meg per kg dose, but 80 meg per kg did not generate that response. Um, but then on the right, you start to see how there's a dose response curve actually looking at some of the cellular changes. In this case, looking at the phosphorylation uh, of enzymes involved in the mTORC C1 pathway, um, which, which is really a pathway that has a lot to do with controlling local protein synthesis in the brain. So really uh, early evidence suggesting that there was this initial event occurring that is then kicking off a cascade um, that leads to increases in local protein synthesis. And then some later work actually showing that this local protein synthesis leads to increases in, in both uh, receptor insertion into membranes, um, but also into the formation of new dendritic spines. So it was work by uh, Ron Duman and George Agajanian showing that with stress, you get a reduction in these dendritic spines, you can see here, but then you can reverse that within one day treatment of ketamine and work showing that these spines are actually active. Uh, other work by Ron's lab um, and, and others uh, really have went on to try to outline the critical components of that uh, cascade that's responsible for the increase uh, in uh, local uh, protein synthesis, increase in spine density, and, and ultimately what we believe is to increases in neuroplasticity in general. Um, and so if we look at this in this cartoon version, this idea is that you start to get this increase in glutamate release, this increased activation postsynaptically of, of AMPA receptors, which then drives uh, the mTORC C1 pathway, but probably other pathways that drive uh, local protein synthesis and ultimately leads to increased spine density formation, um, which is acting to you know, strengthen uh, dendritic and, and, and connections within neurons. So leading to a period of enhanced neuroplasticity. Um, so I, again, the model that, that had been promoted was that stress uh, being one of the pathoideologic factors in depression leads to this decrease uh, in connectivity in, within uh, synapses. Um, and that ketamine acts to reverse this by increasing that glutamate uh, release transiently. And, and I think it's an important point that it's transiently, not uh, a prolonged release that initiates this cascade of events that reforms these connections. Um, and that was a model that was you know, presented first. And that was, uh, I, I still think, where the evidence is most supportive. Um, but there are others that clearly uh, come into play, uh, other components. So the work by Lisa Montesia uh, uh, suggested that it, it could actually be some of these activity independent um, or spontaneous uh, activating NMDA receptors that, that could play a critical role and that they are typically um, having large effects on the uh, EFT, uh, um, uh, EF2, um, which is a enzyme that modulates uh, local protein synthesis by itself. And some of Lisa's work suggests that by really having effects um, blocking those spontaneously active NMDA receptors, you, you're, you're actually increasing local protein synthesis 
and work that converges with RONs, and, and I'll go, uh, this is Lisa's idea that by blocking the EFT to kinase, um, you then can increase local protein synthesis or, or at least stop the block of local protein synthesis. And then with activation, you get the increase in protein synthesis and increased spine density. So these converge on this endpoint of increasing local protein synthesis. They both have a necessary role for the neurotrophic factors, specifically BDNF in generating this response. Um, so although they, they give different explanations why this may occur, they both converge on that point. One of the things that um, may have thrown a little bit of a, um, a wrench in this story was some evidence coming out suggesting that our ketamine may have uh, effective uh, antidepressant-like properties in rodent models. Um, and it started to question our ketamine has about one fifth the activity uh, or the affinity for the NMDA receptor compared to esketamine. You know, esketamine and orketamine is just the racemic mixture. Um, so it started to question, you know, how critical is the NMDA receptor in actually generating that antidepressant-like response? Um, and that was even uh, further questioned uh, paper that came out of Todd Gould's group, um, suggesting that, you know, HNK, hydroxyneuroketamine, which is actually a metabolite of ketamine, um, may be generating antidepressant responses in rodent models. In fact, may be more effective than ketamine itself. And interestingly, what they were saying is the RR version, which is actually generated from the R metabolite of ketamine, um, seemed to be the one generating that antidepressant-like response. So it really started to question um, how, how important the NMDA receptor was at all. What I warn people here, and, and at each step, I'll go back in and, and, and hopefully during the discussion, we, we can look at the, the things to balance this, that this was all done in rodents. And there are several studies now not showing HNK to have those same effects. And some clinical studies um, suggesting that um, the clinical response uh, in patients is not really correlated with HNK levels. In fact, there's some inversely correlated, um, inverse correlations with HNK levels. And it, it calls us into question a little bit. Now, I think all of these, uh, nothing is definitive, either the positive or negative evidence, but I think these are all extremely uh, interesting and, and exciting avenues to pursue. But you have to look at the data in total before you start making major decisions. Um, paper by Todd uh, Gould and, and Panazanos uh, recently tried to merge all this data together, not with the idea that not one of these mechanisms may explain everything, but in fact, they all may contribute something. And this is where I stopped trying to make my cartoons where it's just getting way too complicated to do this in an animation. But this idea that you may have effects on the glutamate release, and in fact, there's work suggesting that RRHNK may directly uh, uh, excite glutamate release and, and lead to increased activation of AMPA receptors. It just may not involve the blockade of the NMDA receptor. And then also the work suggesting that the blockade of these spontaneous NMDA receptors, Lisa Montesia's work, could also act through uh, EFT, uh, EF2 uh, kinase to, to generate these effects. So it's this idea that you know, you may not just have one single mechanism, but they do seem to converge uh, either on the release of glutamate or on the fact of increasing local protein synthesis and, and, and the role of the neurotrophic factor BDNF. So that is one of the you know, main storylines that I think has garnered the greatest support from data. However, there still are some real uh, questions about other things that may play um, a, a large role. Um, the idea of the opiate system. So a very uh, eloquent study by um, uh, Nolan Williams and, um, and Alan Chatsburg came out suggesting that, well, the opiate system may play a critical role. And probably most of you have heard about this, but this was the study where they were able to use a, a mu opiate receptor uh, antagonist uh, naltrexone to block 
ketamine's antidepressant, or, or at least attenuate ketamine's antidepressant effect in a relatively small group of people. This is an N of 12. So you, you always have to be careful in interpreting studies you know, with small ends like this. Um, but it was very interesting and suggested that the activation of the mu opiate receptor may be critical in the response. Um, this was followed by uh, several uh, other you know, studies in rodent models that um, complicated things. Um, so there, there was some, not some direct effects, but uh, uh, Malinow's group and others suggested that even though it may not be direct effects on the opiate receptor, the opiate receptor may be necessary to garner some of these antidepressant likes effects in ketamine. Um, and I know I, I uh, also uh, provided a commentary on, on um, Nolan's paper where suggesting that it wouldn't be unlikely to think that the opiate system, the endogenous opiate system would be in some way be involved in the antidepressant like effects of um, ketamine. We, we know that the endogenous opiate systems involved in the nonspecific effects of placebo effects. Um, you, know, you can block placebo effects on pain and even some placebo effects on mood uh, by giving uh, mu opioid receptor antagonists. So I, I think it's very likely that the mu opioid system or the opioid system in general plays a critical role, but I don't think the evidence and the affinity really isn't there to suggest that ketamine is having its direct effect on the mu system, on the mu opiate receptor. Um, the other, uh, and some of the last things I, I did really want to cover was the nonspecific effects. Um, it, and what I mean nonspecific, I mean effects that aren't so dependent on that proximal effect of ketamine on, uh, on a receptor. But what are the larger effects that this has? And we know that ketamine has pretty profound effects on cognition and perception when it's uh, initially given. Um, and this has led several of the skeptics in the field to say, well, a lot of what you're seeing is really just functional on blinding. And in studies where you have functional on blinding, you get enhanced efficacy compared to placebo. Um, but it's also led others to, to hypothesize that it, um, it has some unique properties, uh, either spiritual or some unique psychological properties that um, foster improvement or, or foster recovery from depression. Um, or it may actually enhance some po positive social interactions that can be used. And, and a lot of this approach is used in ketamine assisted psychotherapies um, in this idea that you may be these non-specific or non-pharmacologically specific effects of ketamine that may have these effects. And you know, with that, you, know, you start to think about well, how can you start to, how can you tease that apart? And one of the things is to look at the relationship between dissociation and the antidepressant response. So there's uh, a lot of interest in how, what's the critical role of dissociation or this psychological change in cognition and perception in being a critical component of the antidepressant response. And you know, the data here is not clear. Um, I, I think most of the studies that have been published suggest at least for that first dose, there is an association between having some change in something like the CAD scale, something representing a level of dissociation. Um, but there's very little evidence to suggest that there's a continued correlation. Um, so after that first dose, that association between the dissociation and the antidepressant response tends to really become minimized. And I, and I know with esketamine, that data really doesn't seem to hold that you know, with the longer term treatments that that relationship between dissociation and antidepressant response really doesn't seem to hold. Um, and also from that study we did uh, with the rapid consortium, we could show that with the CADs, the, the one mg per keg had a much higher effect on CAD scores, a much greater, basically a doubling of the dissociation, but yet on the antidepressant like response, there was no benefit in fact the 0.5 did just as well, if not a little bit better. So I think the real answer is it's complicated. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that, but I would say it's definitely not linear. So um, 
this is not a case where dissociation appears to be necessary or seems to be related directly in a linear fashion to the antidepressant-like response. But just to wrap up, you know, the other nonspecific effects of ketamine, and, and this carries over to other treatments like the, the psychedelic uh, or other psychedelic treatments is these other nonspecific effects of expectation and conditioning are, are likely to play a really big role in generating these antidepressant-like responses. And this is just a really interesting paper, again, that came out of Todd Gould's group, but work with Luana Koalka, who is really one of the, the masters of understanding uh, placebo uh, response. But this is a study, just very quickly, I'll, I'll summarize it, um, showing that after, after getting a ketamine a dose and being conditioned to the place where you're receiving ketamine, and this is rodents, so this is not humans, this is a rodent study, this is mice actually, um, that you can just bring the mouse back into the cage where they got ketamine and then it can generate that antidepressant-like response. So that, that effect was bigger in males and females, but again, these are small ends. So you have to take it a bit with a grain of salt, but it is some evidence that conditioning can play such a large role in this antidepressant-like response. So, um, so it's not even getting the ketamine a second time that had that second antidepressant-like effect. It was actually just bringing them to the place where they got ketamine the first time generated the effect. So some really interesting work and uh, something that can really guide us in our treatment how to optimize this. So just to wrap up, I think I'm right on time. I, I hope I am. Um, uh, you know, I think some of the big questions that remain is what, you know, can we develop novel improved antidepressants? You know, based on these models, it would suggest that amphipotentiators uh, may have a real role. Um, could we target the MGLU system, MGLUR2 uh, targeting drugs may have a big effect, MGLUR5 drugs. Um, how seriously do we need to consider the potential drug-drug interactions? So if we believe these mechanisms then we have to really think carefully about the use of any GABAergic acting drugs, such as the benzos, glutamate release inhibitors, lamotrigine and others could fit into there, or mu uh, antagonist drugs like naltrexone. What about the mechanistic reasons? Um, what are the mechanistic reasons uh, 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 that lead us to special concern? Again, uh, if we're worried about you know, opiate uh, activation, does that have any increased risk for uh, dependence? Um, you know, are there other things that make us really concerned that from that sense, or what do we know about the mechanism, of act, the mechanism of action that suggests potential ways of optimizing treatment? So I think here, you know, if we really believe in this neuroplasticity and this in increased connectivity, can we use integrative therapies? And it's something I know my group is extremely interested in. Can we take advantage of these windows of opportunity? to use treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, like other forms of um, non-pharmacologic treatment to uh, increase the benefit or, or sustain the benefit. And then if we understand neurobiology, we may know the optimal times when to do that. And then lastly is the question, you know, is there just something unique in the non-specific effects of ketamine? You know, why haven't other NMD receptor targeting drugs really proving as effective? Um, and you know, are we looking at something not more nonspecific like these effects on cognition and perception or, or spiritual effects that are driving some of this? And is this maybe an overlap with what we're starting to see with some of the other psychedelic medications? So I think these are some of the real interesting questions that we're yet to fully uh, understand. Again, this is just a very short list of my collaborators that, that we've worked on in, in these studies um, and really, uh, I don't know if many of you knew, but Ron Duman, extremely close colleague of mine, died just the, just a little bit more than a year ago. But his lab was really central in helping us understand this, and yeah, he's greatly missed in the field. So I'll just leave it at that, um, and I think we have questions later on. Thank you.